What an amazing day this is, an amazing time to be alive. And I want to I want to talk this morning from I'm going to share from Mark chapter 6 and I want to talk about honor. And I know this is a house house that honors uh, but there, but there's more and, and there's more that God wants to release. And so I want to begin this morning and I want to show us this quick video that, that is about honor because I want us from the very start of this message to have a taste of what honor really looks like. Heaven is full of honor. And God wants that very same honor that's in heaven to, to be released on earth. And, and so I want us this morning to look in Mark chapter six and, and to look at Jesus and, and to look at what it was like when Jesus went to the city of Nazareth. And Mark chapter six tells the story it says there that Jesus went out from there and came into his hometown. Can you say hometown? So Jesus is at his hometown. And, and, I, and I think the disciples were probably like so excited, like they've been seeing miracles. All these amazing things have been happening. And, and, and now here we go to Jesus's hometown. And I think there was probably such an expectancy on the part of the disciples about What were they going to see in the hometown? Like even expecting increase because these people, they know Jesus. This is where he's from. So it's going to be, it's going to be incredible. But it says when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue and many listeners were astonished and they were saying, where did this man get these things? And what is this wisdom given to him and such miracles as these performed by his hands? Is this not the carpenter? the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown and among his own relatives and his own household. And he could do. I've always wrestled with that phrase right there, (laughs) but that's exactly what it says. He could do no miracle there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and he healed them. And he wondered at their unbelief and he was going around the villages teaching. So Jesus comes to his hometown, to Nazareth, and he's wondering at the unbelief. He says, a prophet is not without honor. And I used to read this passage and really focus on on the unbelief. But then one day I realized the unbelief was because of the lack of honor. Because you see, when we see who Jesus really is, it's not hard to expect a miracle. When you see that Jesus is the healer, it doesn't become a big faith jump to believe that he's going to heal the person that you pray for. In fact, the greater the revelation that we get of him is of who he really is, is uh, that he's healer, he's Lord and Savior. Sometimes we become, it, we're more surprised if it doesn't happen. It's like, because our revelation of him has so increased, it's not hard to believe for it. Yeah. And, and so honor is a big deal. And Nazareth, Jesus' hometown, they were locked into a vision of Jesus in the past. 
But if I believe if only one person in Nazareth had stood up and said, hey guys, yes, Jesus grew up here. Yes, he was a carpenter here. But what if this man is a prophet? What if he's the Messiah? What if he's really the one that we've been praying for? And what if it was changed? And instead of saying a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, what if it said, and Jesus was able to say, blessed is the city that honors a prophet. Life, blessing, and spiritual inheritance will be released there. And what if they ran and they grabbed their sick friends and, and they were bringing people and everyone even who just got in Jesus' shadow was healed? It could have been. And it could have been that many miracles took place in Nazareth and that Jesus was actually amazed at their faith. But it didn't happen that way. But I believe that as we live now in the new covenant, as we have Christ in us, that hometown is actually to be the place of greatest honor. And I, I wanna share some things this morning about, about walking in new places of honor with each other. You know, I was thinking about this this morning. I just added this slide in. You know, we honor people really well at their funerals. <laughs> you know, I, and I sit there and all these testimonies are coming in and, and people are pouring out honor. And sometimes, and, and you're missing someone and you're already grieving, but there's times I've grieved because that person had no idea of how we really felt about them. But what if we don't wait until someone dies to honor them? What if there's so much honor flowing out of this place into Parker County, into your neighborhood? Jesus was only able to heal a few sick there. But in the same chapter, right at the end of the chapter, there's, there's a story about a region called Gennesaret. And it says, when they got out of the boat, immediately the people recognized him. Now, I want you to like to see that difference there. It's not, oh, this is, this is the carpenter who grew up here. This is, you know, his brothers are here. He's, he's Jesus, the carpenter. It's like, no, they recognized him. This is the one who works miracles. And they ran about the whole countryside and they began to carry here and there on their pallets those who were sick to the place where they heard he was. And wherever he entered villages or cities or countryside, they were laying the sick in the marketplaces and imploring him that they might just touch the fringe of his cloak and as many touched it were being cured. <laughs> Same Jesus, totally different story. And so I wanna talk about three things today that can hinder us from walking in honor. And one of those is actually familiarity. That the fact that I met Jesus when I was eight years old and I've been going to church all my life can be an awesome blessing, but it can also be a great hindrance. And see, familiarity confines my perspective of who you are to who you've been in the past. And so if I don't watch it, I, I, I'm going to hold you to, to who you have been in the past rather than coming at you with a fascination and walking in this place of childlike wonder with a heart to see the greatness and the beauty I've not seen in you before. I was thinking about this yesterday you know, uh, David Fish is, is, is our son and, um, you know, David came over and he's, he's cooking these steaks for us. You know, he's, he's been hanging around that New River Elders. And like, he really knows how to do this. Like, I don't even pretend to cook a steak anymore. I can cook a good hamburger. So David and Madison are over and we're enjoying being with them and, and especially, you know, enjoying Sophie and Theo. <laughs> and uh, David's cooking these steaks and I'm just kind of stepped back. I was like, you know, 
This isn't the same David who was eating hot dogs from QT and cooking microwave chicken pies. And I was just stepping back like, I, you know, I wonder if there are other areas that as his dad, that I still need to see how he's grown and who, who he is and who, who he's becoming. And even, even as he's leading worship, which he does a wonderful job, but what else, you know, is, is emerging in him. And so I'm, I'm looking as a dad and, and how powerful he is as a teacher. And I believe he's, I believe he carries a movement of, of young people, you know, that, that God's powerfully marked him for a generation to come. But it's important for me as a parent to not lock David into chicken pot pie, David. But I want to, I want to see new steak, David. And I really enjoy steak, David, by the way, it was, it was very good. And what would happen today if you looked at that person next to you and kind of stepped back and just looked at them and went, wow, wow, look, look, look who this person has become. They're not, they're not who they were five years ago. And so we want to step into fascination and we also want to step out of frozen identity. And that is where we lock someone in to who we have known them to be in the past. It occurs when we lock someone in to who they were in a previous season and do not recognize growth, maturity, and increase of gifting and authority. You know, I, I just even look, look in this house and in the, in the short time that we've been relating together and just the increase that's happened here, the increase on the team and, and even, you know, Joey and Erica, you guys, and just your leadership and, and how you've led this church from a difficult place into a place of prosperity and how you guys were faithful to lead boldly through the last several years and that you didn't shrink back in fear when there was huge pressure on pastors and leaders to shrink back in fear. You guys have leaders that stepped out boldly in that season and that's part of why many of you are here right now. Can we just give them a hand? And just to have watched you people, how you've grown and, and who you're becoming in the Lord, it's a beautiful thing. And, and so I don't want to hold you back to, to who you were. And Nazareth, they were hanging on to Jesus the carpenter. And he was, but he was so much more. And so, you know, <laughs> do you want your table repaired or, or do you want your crippled child healed? <laughs> and, and Nazareth did not see the crippled child healed because they, were, they, they had a picture of Jesus that they were frozen onto and, and they, couldn't, they couldn't let go and see that there was so much more. And I, I, don't want, I want to see who you really are in Jesus. And you know, we need each other as the body of Christ because you carry a revelation of Jesus that I don't carry. And I want to see Jesus in you. I want to see the beauty of Jesus that you carry and the way you manifest his presence. And I want to look at every person looking for that. I want to see who you are. And so we want to walk with fresh per perspective. I want to remember who you were and I want to recognize who you are now. And I also want to affirm who you're becoming. Sometimes also we have a false security. And, and Nazareth, they, they had this kind of thing like, yeah, we've, we've got this. You know, we, we know, we know him. And, you know, for those of us who've been around a while, if we don't watch it, it can be, I've encountered God thousands of times and I've been a part of revivals. And so we can kind of carry like this, uh, you know, I've got the revival merit badge. <laughs> I've been there, I've done that, I've seen, I've welcomed moves of God. But you know what? Usually it's people who've been a part of the previous move of God who reject the fresh move of God. And I've seen people that I, that I feel like are much more 
spiritual and the place they have with God, I respect so much. But I've seen them reject the, come, the fresh move of God. And so for me, I'm praying, I'm like, God, please don't let me miss this next move. I, wanna, I, I know it's going to be different than I expect. It's going to be different than the last move. And I welcome that. Please help me to not miss it and to perceive it and to be a part of what you're doing. I've encountered God before. You've encountered God before. But we also, we come, we come in this place of desperation of God, I've got to know you more today. I've got to see you here at New River today. I've got to hear your voice. Jesus, I want to see and know you more today. And for the next billion years, you are going to be completely fascinated, overcome, and overwhelmed with who the person of Jesus is. Because there is no one else, no one else like him. So what does honor look like on the earth? I want to just give us a, some quick Biblical background here on the subject of honor. Family is the foundation of honor in society. And one of my biggest prayers today is that in each of our homes, that there's going to be more honor. Yes, I know there's some honor in your home, but, but there is more. And Ephesians 6, 2 says, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. And so notice it doesn't say here, honor your father and mother if you think they're honorable. <laughs> and, and maybe your parents, maybe it's, maybe it's kind of hard for some of you to find a way to honor. Let the Lord show you how to honor your parents. Maybe, I know he'd love to answer that prayer of Lord, show me how to honor my parents more. It's the first commandment with a promise. It says, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. You see, part of honor, as you study it throughout the scripture, is that honor releases inheritance. And it's really important for us to have, and I'm not just talking about physical inheritance here, I'm talking about spiritual inheritance. Because whatever your family was like, the Lord set your family apart to have spiritual inheritance whether your family accessed it or not, whether your parents access spiritual inheritance, if you will honor your parents, God wants to give you life. He wants to give you that spiritual inheritance that maybe your parents didn't take. But it's there for you and you need it because God doesn't want us starting from ground zero in every generation. And I love what I see in this younger generation because they're walking in levels of honor that I had no idea how to walk in when I was their age. I'm watching young pastors back when I remember when I was a young pastor and I just thought all these older pastors just had all this old stuff. And I would go into a church and I'm here to bring in the new thing, you know? And I'm just glad sometimes the Lord didn't strike me down with lightning. And he was very merciful. And even the, the places where I went with that attitude, even the pastors that I had this kind of idea that they were the old that needed to go out, that they treated me so mercifully. God is really good to us <laughs> and really forgiving. So honor is part of family. And that's the foundation of honor. And then 1 Peter 3 says, you husbands in the same way live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone who's weaker since she's a woman and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life. And this is really where it begins for kids are watching their fathers honor their mothers and mothers are honoring fathers and they're growing up in this home where they see, taste, and experience honor. And that when it says they're a joint, a joint heir, it means a co-heir, partner of the same inheritance. And even down in verse eight, this passage continues to talk about inheritance. So honor brings us into alignment with inheritance. 
We had a season at Convergence where we were just really praying, Lord, take us deeper in honor. And, and so for, for a season, we just like every, and we had been walking through a very difficult time at this point. I was like, and I was asking the Lord, I was like, Lord, how do we come out of this? Because I, honestly, I was, I was concerned. Like, can we, really, can we really come out of this place? And the Lord said, I want you to flood the church right now with honor. And so every Sunday we picked out several people. I mean, we were very intentional. We had like certificates and I, I honored people. I, I made, I kind of made a name for them, you know, like, you know, people who had, had been doing things for years, like the, the person who'd been serving in the nursery for 10 years, you know, and, and we made a certificate and, and, and we just said, thank you so much for serving in the nursery these last 10 years. And we just honor you. We clapped, we blessed and we poured out honor. And then, and then the Lord's, showed us, he's like, okay, now I want you to take honor out into the city. And so we, we prepared these bags of, of like gift certificates and to restaurants and, and other things. And we just had all these prepared. And as people left church, we said, hey, on your way out, we want you to grab, we want you to grab a bag. And this week we're going to take an honor bag to our first responders. And so we'd go out right after church and we'd just go and we'd, we'd go down to the fire station and we'd just say, hey, we are so thankful for you. We just want to honor you. Thank you. This is just to bless you. Thank you for your service. And if it opened up, we prayed for them. We blessed them. And, and we had so much fun pouring out honor on our city. Honor aligns us with inheritance. And you want to know what? the atmosphere of the church in that season shifted and we begin to step back into a place of momentum. And as believers, you have experienced the most incredible honor that there is to experience. Jesus has taken you from someone who was running away from him, from someone who was living in his self-sufficiency and sin. And he has taken you by his blood, by the finished work of the cross, by his resurrection. He has poured out the Holy Spirit now and Holy Spirit lives inside of you. You are a new creation. You have become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He didn't just give you forgiveness. He made you righteous and he seated with, he seated you with him next to him in the heavenly places. I want to tell you, there is no greater honor than to be seated with him. And so because you are so honored, you can give honor when people don't give you honor back. You can give honor when people treat you dishonorably. You can give honor back because you have access to all of the honor of heaven. And so when a waitress doesn't treat you right and you feel that dishonored, you don't have to respond and dishonor back. You can give them a larger tip than you were going to give them because you have honor and you are a person who overflows with honor. So I'm going to honor you whether you're honorable or not. One, because you're made in the image of God. And two, I will honor you because God honored me when I wasn't honorable. <laughs> he gave honor to me. So, Jesus. 2 Peter 1, 17. For when he received honor. Can you just say the word honor for me? So this is... This is Peter talking about when, when the father honored Jesus at the transfiguration. So he said, when he received honor and glory from God, the father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. So I want to just help. I want to give us three keys to releasing honor now. And I, and I want us to look at this, at what the father did here with Jesus. This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. One, he said, my beloved son. That's value. One of the key components of honor is value. 
And so when people get around us, there's something in us, something in the way we talk, something in, in the way we move towards them, in the way we treat them, that rather than feeling devalued, they feel lifted up and valued. And that's something I'm really praying. I want, I want that to increase in my life. I want every single person that gets around me, no matter what they're doing, where they are, how they're living, what party or whatever, <laughs> it doesn't matter. I want them to feel valued. And that is one of the key components. And I want to tell you, People are so hungering and thirsting to feel valued. I, I was driving through Starbucks a while back and, and, and the girl came on. And I don't remember her name. It was, you know, maybe it was Melissa or something. She said, hey, hi, this is Melissa. What can I get for you today? And I just, I said, I said hi, Melissa. And when I said it, I felt like, Something really happened. And there was a pause. Like there was a silence. Like, you there? You know? And she came back. She said, thank you for saying my name like that. All I did was just my normal day. I just spoke her name back to her and she felt value from that. People are hungry for value. And so value is one of the key components of honor. And up above in that passage where it says honor, the Greek word there means to fix the value to price. And so when people get around you, they're going to feel that there's a high price for their life, high value, that they are worth it. They are worth a moment of your looking into their eyes, speaking life into them, they're worthy of our <laughs> putting it aside for a moment and being fully engaged and present in that place. I value you. And then another key component of identity, of honor is identity. This is my beloved son. You're my son. You are precious. And that's one of the key components of honor, again, as we saw in this whole passage, that if Nazareth had recognized who Jesus was, if they'd seen his identity, they would have been able to honor him and they would have been able to respond in faith. And then blessing. I am well pleased with you. And it can, it can be very simple. I remember I was sitting, um, my, my hairstylist, doesn't he do an amazing job? Um, <laughs> I just want there to be hair to, for him to style. And uh, I said to him the other day, I said, you know, you know, Rand, you've been, you've been cutting my hair for over 20, 20 years. And I want you to know how thankful I am for that and how thankful I am for you as a friend and, and for what you, you bring into my life. I value. And, and I want you to know, Rand, that you're a great hairstylist, but... I want you to know that you really disciple people, that the conversations that you have stir me spiritually. And I know you do that with other people and being a, a great hairstylist is awesome, but I want you to know, Rand, that I see you. I see you not just as a hairstylist, but as a disciple maker. I'm, I'm, that's identity. And then I said, you know what? I believe, I believe it's gonna increase even more in coming years that, that you're gonna find yourself with things to share for people like you haven't even had for them before. And so now, then I'm releasing blessings. So the components of honor, value, identity, and blessing. And one more story, a guy named Mephibosheth. Say Mephibosheth. All right. One day the Bible says that David, which is an amazing thing, he's just looking as a king, he's like, I wonder if there's somebody I can just bless and honor and show kindness to. Is there anybody who was related to Saul, you know, and, and to, to my friend Jonathan that I can show honor to today? 
And, and somebody said, yeah, there's a guy named Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth, I gotta say it right. I gotta be careful too. Sometimes I've said things really wrong. I almost did there, huh? But Mephibosheth, there we go. David called him and said, hey, I want you to come. And he took Mephibosheth and he said, you know what? Mephibosheth actually in one of the verses said, I'm a dead dog. I'm no good dead dog. But David took him, he says, no, you're not a dead dog. You're a son of a king and I know who you are. And he took him and he brought him to his table and he restored him. He said, I'm gonna give you a place to live. I'm gonna give you servants. I'm gonna honor you because I see who you are. God is so longing to release honor on the earth. And I want us to stand this morning and I want us to, I want us to just pray in this place. And Jesus, we, we recognize you in this place. Jesus, we recognize you that you are here today and and we don't come thinking that that we know who you are when there's so much more to you. When there's so much more to know today. Lord, would you break off of us the familiarity and the places where we've locked you in with with who we knew you to be in the past, which was true, but there's more. And let there be such a, a hunger in us that says, Jesus, I've got to know you more. I've got to see who you are. And let us come with a, a childlike expectancy. What, what are you going to do today? What are you going to pour out today? There is no limit to what you could do in this room right now, Jesus. It is nothing for you to heal every disease and sickness in this place today. You are such a great and awesome God. And so, Lord, we ask you to come and blow away that familiarity and that there would be a fresh hunger in our hearts to see and know and a childlike fascination with who you are. And Lord, I pray that in our relationships. I pray for it in our marriages that more honor will flow in the marriages at New River, God. In every home, Lord, show show us, Lord, as husbands, how to honor our wives and wives, how to honor husbands. And Father, show us how to honor our fathers and our mothers. That the full inheritance that you have for this house would be released. That the inheritance that you have for Parker County, Lord, for the harvest that's in your heart for this season, for the ones that you're preparing and have been bringing from all over the earth to this house for this season, Father, that you will find a house that is ready. And Father, that you will find a house that is overflowing with the honor of heaven. And that honor will flow into this county, Lord, and into Fort Worth and into the nations from what you do in this house. God, let us see each other with fresh eyes and fresh perspective. Let us see as parents. Don't let us lock our kids into a previous season, but let us see who they are now and who they're growing into, God. Thank you, Father, that you honored us when we were not honorable and that you have seated us with you in the greatest place of honor in heaven with you, Jesus. Thank you. We honor and exalt you in this place today.